I'll, I'll just start now as um, others. Um, good afternoon, all. Uh, my name is Billy Kelly, and I'm the chair of the National Academic Integrity Network. And I'm delighted to welcome you all to this first session of National Academic Integrity Week uh, 2023. Um, just to remind you, this panel and the, the subsequent panel is being recorded and will be put up on the QQI YouTube channel after the week uh, finishes. Now, National Academic Integrity Week is a week where we set out to raise awareness of academic integrity and we hope to prompt actions by stakeholders to engage with things that will improve academic integrity across the tertiary sector here in Ireland. Uh, this last year has seen a remarkable change in um, the academic integrity landscape in Ireland. Artificial intelligence tools, ChatGPT, BAR, DALI, to name but a few, are hugely disruptive to the education sector. And they've shifted the focus of all stakeholders, yet the core goal is unchanged. And yeah, I hope you can see that now. Can you can you see my or yes, thanks, Owen. Thumbs up, always works. Um, the, um, in some sense, right, okay, we, we thought we were dealing just with academic integrity. And we we're quite clear on what academic integrity was. It was that commitment and demonstration of honest and moral behavior. Um, assessment integrity was always part of this, right? It was always part of that academic integrity landscape. So it was about trustworthy assessment and it was giving learners, a f uh, the, ensuring they had a fair assessment of their learning, right, okay, of the module learning outcomes. But clearly, right, okay, what we have had in spades in the last year is the advent of artificial intelligence, which really throws a cat among the pigeons, right, okay, in terms of what we had thought uh, were our primary activities in relation to academic integrity. And as of now, artificial intelligence is really just generative artificial intelligence. It's a large language model, model simulating human intelligence. And um, we fear what will happen if and when. And I think it's probably a when we get to general artificial intelligence, where actually uh, the, that it goes beyond the large language mo modules in terms of where it is, right, uh, it, it can do. Um, so this is in some sense the context in which we're working. The theme of this week's sessions is the learner perspective. So it's very much in that top corner, academic integrity. And we want to place a particular emphasis on the student voice. Now, to some extent, this is in a contrast with what has been done in the past, where there may have been more of a focus on the perspective of institutions and how they might deal with the challenges of academic integrity. So what's important about this week is we're looking to learners uh, for inspiration and place them centrally in our considerations. So it's very much right academic integrity and in turn what they tell us about assessment integrity uh, as, as important. Um, the, the first of this week's sessions when we follow this brief introduction is a student panel and the panel comprises students from a variety of disciplines and higher education institutions discussing academic integrity and the current and emerging challenges they see for students and we hope identify some potential responses to those issues and you'll hear from them in just a few minutes. Tomorrow on Tuesday we hear from a student Stephanus Lim from Imperial College in London who's going to speak to the response of UK universities to the issue of artificial intelligence and the challenges this has created for academic integrity. So Stephanus's talk will address the readiness and response of a sample of UK universities as to how they plan to tackle AI related academic misconduct. Now registration uh, for that has closed, but if you haven't registered and you still want to, just email uh, Adele at academicintegrity at qqi.ie and um, we'll, uh, we'll get you through. 
Wednesday is the International Day of Action for Academic Integrity, um, organized by the International Center for Academic Integrity. There are sessions throughout the day on Wednesday from early morning, starting at 8.30 in the morning through to the late evening. And you'll find details of all of these, if I don't make a hash of putting a link into the, into the chat. Should have done this beforehand. So you'll find the link on, on the chat and you'll find that, right? Okay, you can find a link to this. Um, uh, you can find details on all, there's a whole series of sessions right across the day. And I'd encourage you to take a look at, at uh, that program of talks and register for those that interest you. On Thursday, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Mary Davis um, from Oxford Brooks University. Mary is the academic integrity lead at Oxford Brooks, and she's been researching academic integrity matters for nearly 20 years. And her particular perspective is on inclusivity. Uh, Mary has a particular interest in the potential of universal design for learning, thinking, in supporting academic integrity. And her talk will focus on strategies to include all students and staff in promoting and supporting academic integrity, looking at it through that uh, UDL lens. And on Friday session, you'll get to hear me doing my best to give voice to the responses of uh, just over 6,000 Irish students who responded to a topical module on academic integrity as part of studentsurvey.ie. And this survey differed from a lot of other ones. And in, in the past, most of the surveys have been done internationally. Um, uh, the focus has been much more on trying to identify the extent to which students engage with cheating behaviours. And this survey was, was looking at it from a student perspective, say, asking the question, what kinds of supports am I getting? Am I getting the right supports? And in particular, what's my lived experience of academic integrity issues? So the really rich information right on, on students and their answers to an open question uh, which asked, what more could my institution do to help students avoid engaging in academic misconduct? That's going to be the focus of this analysis and drives a set of, of draft recommendations for HEIs, but it is very much what, what students have said. At this point, I'm going to um, say no more, and I'm going to pass over to Elva Casey, who's going to moderate uh, the student panel. Um, so. Over to you, Elva. Thank you very much, Billy. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I'm delighted to be here with our student panel today, and I'm really looking forward, as I'm sure all of you are, to uh, hearing the student voice um, and um, to, I'm sure, having some interesting conversations. So um, obviously everyone is really welcome to contribute to those conversations. So if you want to put any comments in the chat as we're going along, and we'll also have um, some time hopefully towards the end for some um, Q&A as well. Um, so Oshin, if you don't mind, I might start with you. Someone has to be first to get started. And um, we might just look at, I suppose, well, well, when we're looking at academic integrity, um, there can be that really strong temptation, I think, in academic institutions to front load programs, you know, to hit students with everything during orientation and in those first couple of weeks um, of their program, all about academic integrity. So my question to you really is, what do you think from the student perspective students actually need to know about academic integrity? And maybe more importantly, even when do they need to know it? That's great. Thanks, uh, Elva. Um, I think, I suppose, when when thinking about that question, I, I, I always think that like my own knowledge of academic integrity is that it's critical to, to all students and it ensures fairness and honesty, but also like credibility to, to your degree and when you graduate from, from education. Um, however, I think the, the general understanding among students is often not up to, up to that standard. Um, I think always academics and institutions have a very, very high level of understanding for academic integrity, but it doesn't often um, dilute down or it doesn't dilute very well down to students. Um, and I think that's down to the power of comprehension uh, that often the, I suppose, it's difficult to, to make students understand or to help them understand 
and um, that like academic dishonesty in any way is, is unacceptable but it also can have severe consequences and um, from my own institution I've seen that like many students have end up in their situations by making poor or ill-informed decisions and I think that's critical because it shows that the education for this area isn't exactly there and um, I think down to the basics of it I think the fundamentals are, are, are key so students should know how to cite correctly, but also avoid copying others works either intentionally or unintentionally. I think that's important for, especially for collaborative work. And I came from a course where collaborative work was, was encouraged. And also like a lot of our coursework was, was uh, hands-on and, and practical in, in its nature. And often there was times where there could be times where you could end up copying others by accident. Um, and I think it, it's for, for teaching those skills and how to, I suppose, how to make your own work your own. Um, and obviously collaborative work and collaborative assignments are important in, in many courses, but it's it's how the academic integrity piece is delivered to those courses is, is what is really important. And um, I do think it needs to be very early in their academic journey for all students. But I think, um, like you said, at the, at the start of the year, it can be very, very heavy in terms of information overload. Um, and I think it needs to be simple and concise when it comes to academic integrity, because it can be made kind of, it can be made complicated for students. And um, I think that in some situations, it suits better for it to be earlier. Um, but I, I think it can't be at the start of the semester or, I, either. I think, um, for, for, for me anyway, I think some sort of a module that might encourage, I suppose, working around or learning about academic integrity could be critical to students that would run through a whole semester. It wouldn't overload them at the start of a semester, but also would teach them how to, um, how to, I suppose, work with academic integrity, but also not to be um, like using academic or not to be uh, dishonest in any way when it comes to academic integrity. Um, I think as well, like obviously I, I, I spoke about early in the act or in the educational and art journey, but I think this also applies to international students as well. And um, I think that um, a level of, especially in my own institution, we have a high level of um, our, uh, the, the infringements when it comes to academic integrity that comes through um, international students who may not have English as their first language. And I think this is a, is, is a particular int interesting fault uh, in, the whole system I think um, and it's it's down to I suppose correctly teaching and educating again those students um, I suppose around the the intricate details of academic integrity and how certain depending on they might be using uh, say sites that uh, help with their English grammar and to ensure that I suppose they're saying things in the right format um, but I think there's a level of um, that fine line needs to be addressed to those students. And it's also offering extra help to those students as well, because it's not easy to, to study true English, um, especially if it's not your, your main language. Um, so I, I think if considerations could be given to like all of these areas, but I think it, it, it's down to education. And I think it really ties back into that power of comprehension. If students can understand and comprehend what academic integrity is, it will avoid students being uh, dishonest or um, being in situations where they infringe on academic integrity. Okay, thank you, Oshin. Some really interesting points there around actually the comprehension of what academic integrity is, when and where and how we need to, to have that and, and definitely interesting to draw um, attention to additional challenges that some students might face, whether that's international students or, or other students. And um, thank you for that, Oshin. Claude, I might just tease out a little bit more around that, I suppose, that support piece and the concept of support further and beyond just disseminating information, maybe creating inclusive cultures of academic integrity. Um, what do you think is being done well, if anything, in that in those inclusive cultures around academic integrity and then what needs to be done better or more? Um, so I think that a lot of work has been done around campuses um, about like updating policies and creating more so an academic integrity policy than having plagiarism policies and stuff like that. Um, I think 
a lot more work um, needs to be done in terms of getting that information across to students that those policies exist. Um, like a big issue is the first time students find out about these policies is whenever they're being brought forward on you know, a board and that can be quite intimidating. So I think around creating a culture where it's ingrained into the ethos of the uh, college is uh, like a big thing. Um, I think that, you know, education and training needs to be given to both staff and students around this. So workshops, seminars, online courses, like even like what Oshin was saying, like the courses are very important to have and even it needs to go as far as being ingrained into the curriculum. Um, and like that, that's for staff and students as well. Like students need to be educating themselves on the policies. And if they're unsure whether they're doing something that could amount to cheating, like they need to seek clarification on that. Um, uh, another thing is like, is teaching students how to cite properly. Many times, uh, academic misconduct can purely be accidental so I think it's important that we're telling students how to cite properly trying to make it as easy as possible and you know trying to tell students about the importance of citing as well like they need to make sure that people are getting credit for their work the same way that if anyone ever took inspiration from a piece that they wrote uh, they'd like to be credited for it as well um, I think policies need to go as far as, you know, like, so a big thing that we're seeing is students finding it hard to manage time and stress. Like, they don't know that there's facilities on campus like academic writing centres and such that can um, help them. Um, but even at that, like, we've seen now in today's climate that there is more students who are having to work part time or even full time in that respect. So having more policies that, you know, you're having reasonable accommodations in case students are, you know, fi falling behind that they won't opt for cheating, but they might opt for, you know, a small extension on their project, which is better because learning outcomes are being met. And, you know, it keeps the credibility of a degree then instead of, you know, going down this cycle of students engaging in academic misconduct. Um, and at the same time, having that courageous conversation built into the policies to ensure that whenever students are pulled towards um, discipline boards, that they uh, that they can have open communication and tell, you know, whoever they're speaking to about what they did, how they engaged in it and maybe where that site was. So the institution can relay that information back to QQI and, you know, it can be reported as such. Um, so I think little things like that and obviously like whenever academic integrity policies are being updated like they need to be regularly looked at to make sure that it's keeping up with the advancements in technology and whenever they are being updated like students need to have a voice um, on that so that's all. Yeah. That, that's really interesting. And, and um, Claudia, you, you've mentioned policies a lot there and policies can be dry and boring uh, for anyone, <laughs> student or otherwise. So I'm just wondering, you, you said there are a lot of students, you know, the first time they're engaging with policies is possibly when they're up in front of, bo of a board for misconduct. Uh, so in terms of the culture and the culture of academic integrity, is there more we can do to build policies and engaging with policies into culture? Like, I feel like with the policies, you know, whenever students are being given assignments, the policies need to be there, even if mm. they don't look at them, like it needs to be there and present so they know that they exist. Um, They need to be communicated in the classroom. Like, I think every time that an assignment is being done to really drill home the importance of this, because, you know, like your degree at the end of the day, like you invest thousands into it and you don't want it to be tarnished by you know cases of academic misconduct in the institution and stuff um I know that there is some institutions my friends um went to uh like the UK to college and stuff and before they can um enroll in their classes and stuff they had to take 
uh, quiz or whatever on academic integrity that related to the policies that existed on their campus, which is an interesting way of approaching it. I think that what really needs to be done, though, is like every university has a different culture and I feel like every university has different kinds of students and stuff like that. So the best way to find out how like you can relay those policies is to engage with the students on the ground. So find out what suits them and, you know, what they and how they want to be uh, involved in it or how they want to be engaging with it. So I think definitely engaging with the students' unions, the students in your classes, having that open communication and culture is very important. Okay, thank you. And Claudia, I'm not going to let you off just yet. One more question for you, because really following on from that, and let's say maybe the, the, the culture piece fails and um, the student does feel tempted towards cheating um, and then they, in fact, te are tempted towards engaging with some of these cheating industries because they're feeling so overwhelmed potentially and possibly they're feeling unsupported. Um, how can these temptations be avoided. You mentioned courageous conversations there. Is, is that a possible means of avoiding these temptations? Um, I think definitely, like as I said about the the policy, so having like reasonable accommodations if students are falling behind, really telling students about the um, things that are on campus for them. Like so many institutions have such fabulous academic writing centres that can help students and they just don't know about it. So procrastination is a big thing. Um, then obviously like there is an onus on students as well. So like they need to be seeking uh, clarification and they need to be taught about how they can use technology and study aids responsibly. Like instead of just pretending like these things don't exist, we need to have you know, a conversation about, you know, how they can be integrated into your like study, but in a responsible way that doesn't actually impede on academic integrity when you are completing your assessment. So really drawing out a line and having that established is very important. And, you know, we need to talk about the long term impacts that, you know, engaging in cheating culture can have on, you know, students learning and stuff. Like if you're struggling with your undergrad, um, who's to say that the same thing won't happen if you decide to engage in a master's? So actually engaging with your course material instead of opting for um, cheating services, like it does in promote more of a culture of lifelong learning if you do decide to um, continue your education in the future and stuff. So I think kind of communicating the risks that it could potentially have mm -hmm. in the future as well. And that goes as far as, you know, workplaces and stuff like that. <clears throat> Thank you for that, Loda. And definitely that that more um, longevity, I suppose, of, of our actions is, is so important. And Owen has just made a really good point there in the chat. A policy is only as good as how well it is understood. I mean, otherwise, it's just a document that sits there and, and, and has no purpose, even if it's been developed through a collaborative process. If nobody who wasn't involved in the development understands or engages with it, it's, it's somewhat pointless. That's a really good point as well. And um, thank you, Cloda, and thank you for that point, Owen. Brian, we might move on to yourself now, if you don't mind. So. It's really completely impossible these days to talk around one of the AIs without bringing up another AI. So academic integrity, everything around academic integrity is so strongly linked with uh, artificial intelligence and generative AI now. Um, do you see advantages and potentials for that AI for students, which will still maintain those high academic and assessment standards? Yeah, so look, I think personally, big fan of AI. I, I'm a big fan which of- Which one, which one, Brian? Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, ChatGPT is, you know, it's everyone's go-to at the moment. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of kind of the possibilities of the equity it can kind of bring to assessments. Um, look, we, we all know with uh, Gen AI, you can have uh, plagiarising and academic dishonesty where people copy and paste assessments are to getting straight from it. Um, we also have the issues around, you know, like ethical concerns where we have who was the content made by, you know, who who made it, where is it coming from and is it genuine? Can you trust it or can you not trust it? 
you know, it, there's a loads of issues around that and then intellectual property as well, like who the content that you're getting from it, who owns it? Is it you, the person that's using it and putting the data or the person that originally got the data from, you know? And of course, then it kind of it can hamper skill development. So, you know, depending on how you use it personally, I don't think it has to hamper um, skill development, but with the likes of, you know, um, critical thinking, problem solving development and stuff like that. Um, it can hamper that, but I think it's the way you assess it and the way you involve it in your assessment. It's a case of are you are students just going off and using this or staff and students working as partners to kind of work on how they can best use AI to be the tool of their content rather than being the builder of their content, you know? Um, but like the possibilities that you can bring for like equity, I think is uh, you you can have like you can use it as study aids. Like if I wanted to do a kind of study, uh, if I want to study on something and I work better with quizzes, chances are your lecturer may not have study quizzes ready for the content before an exam. So you can just put in a topic into uh, ChatGPT just saying, can you write me a quiz on such and such a topic? And you can get you can get it through that and then you can get it to correct it. Same with that, if you are working on a piece of your thesis and stuff like that, you can input it into the AI and try and get personalized feedback on what you're working on, rather than waiting for turnaround periods of lecturers who have high workloads trying to get around to get dedicated feedback, you can get AI to kind of get that for you. As well as that, you kind of, you can have AI doesn't stop, you know, it's around the clock help where if you need kind of guidance to something that you're doing, um, you need certain questions addressed or providing resources, AI can do that. Now, we all know that AI can hallucinate sometimes. It can give you false references and false information, um, but it's it's using AI wisely. There, you can input it and blindly trust it, or you can do your due diligence and use your own um, self-taught to get a topic, uh, ask it for a reference list, then follow up with that reference list and see are those articles real? Because what used to take me maybe a day to find a open sourced um, thesis or uh, article that I'm trying to use for my uh, thesis or an exam or I'm trying to do, I'm trying to find, look for legit resources that are open to the public. It took me hours to find something that was relevant. Whereas if I want to look for something now, I put it in the topic, ask for a reference list, it takes me less than five minutes. And the amount of time that takes takes a stress off students that are that would be tempted to cheat or used to be dis academically dishonest by having that kind of time freed up for them to actually work on assessing the article and using that um, properly into their assessment. Um, also, if you put a, a source of data into it and you need, you just need the source, the soul of what it's trying to say, you can get kind of constructive, get it constructed into little feedback points of what the article is trying to say, which again, if you may have learning difficulties or something like that, it kind of, it's that little assistance to try and help you get through the content that you're working with, to try and get to the soul of what it is to help with the assignments. Um, and just like, try and on on that side on yeah. the equity piece that that yeah. you've um because it's a really interesting point i think and and you know maybe one that's lost over a lot of the time but i suppose a, a counter argument might be that well in terms of um the financial piece that um obviously we know that uh, paid for services are are significantly better versions uh, even in terms of chat gpt itself the pay for version is significant improvement and um, so does that create an inequity if it's going to be that some students can afford to engage with better supports than others yeah like i mean you can definitely bring equity and it can also widen the equity gap you know it depends on whether in the future i presume that it's my assumption that institutes will maybe um source a uh, AI of some degree for their institution, and that means if a institution is better fund is better funded, will they get a better source of AI, or you know, in comparison to one that's not quite as well funded or maybe uh, interested in that area? Um, it can definitely widen the gap. But the same thing is, there's some students out there that can't afford a laptop. Is the equity of being able to do their assignments and not having access to internet when they're at home is that widening the gap of equity? Uh, I think to try and completely close the gap of equity, I think we are. A good period of time away from kind of closing that gap. Um, I, I think it's trying to support, 
is trying to support students as much as you can under the best circumstances rather than, oh, well, if all students can't use this, then why would we bother using it? You know, um, there's always some institutes will have better learning supports that have more staff members to assess to, to get access to to help you with your stuff. Some will have math centres, writing centres and stuff like that and other colleges won't. Because other colleges can't afford to have those staff in those centres, do we say just close down those writing centres? Do we close down those math centres? It's unfortunately there'll always be some degree of inequity of uh, education until uh, this sector is properly funded. I think. Okay, so you see this as a, as a way of addressing some of those in some ways and and acknowledging them in others, and and you'd mentioned obviously um just briefly there I suppose the UDL side of of um support as well. So do you think that um Gen AI has potentials beyond assessment? I suppose to to be supportive to students, or are you thinking specifically around assessment there? Well, like it can be, it can be, it can be used to kind of understand the content that you're getting from your lecturers mm -hmm. better. It can be able to, you can put stuff into different AIs where it'll rephrase or, you know, it'll paraphrase or rephrase things for you. So maybe you don't understand what they're trying to say from a specific thing. And mm -hmm. I, I tell you, I've been in lectures where I haven't understood something. There wasn't time to ask the lecturer something. I've spent hours on Google trying to find out what they mean. And it's the same thing with spending the hours trying to find articles and stuff to be better learn, learned in the area that you're working in. It can rephrase things to better understand, have that kind of just around the whole education, not just assessment, but just your learning experience can be enhanced by using it. But yeah, there has to be a partnership between lecturers and students to to what degree it can be used, you know, uh, how it can be used. Um, just rather than blindly doing it, because then it comes down to the difference between lecturers of how much they want to be used within their assessment and their learning and stuff like that. It's trying to come with a uh, holistic approach from all institutions, all departments, all modules um, to have the same consistency. OK, thank you for that, Brian. And it's it's certainly always going to be uh, well in the foreseeable future, uh, quite a an emotive and controversial conversation. So it's really interesting to tease out some of those ideas. Just uh, Nicola has uh, said in the chat, I think it would be preferable for learners to clarify with their lectures rather than AI, even if after class if possible. To be fair, I think Brian probably would agree with that, but if not possible, it's probably what, what you're saying to ensure they receive the correct application of the, the detail. OK. So uh, definitely always going to be um, debate and, and two sides to any conversation or if not more around AI, um, but interesting to, to hear those those perspectives from from a learner. So thank you, Brian. Owen, if you're happy, I'm going to move on to you and we're going to stay with assessment um, around academic integrity. Um, and sometimes there can be a, something of a disconnect between what institutions think students need and what students think they need around assessment. So what do you think students need more knowledge of or support in when it comes to accessible and engaging assessment? And how can institutions actually achieve this? Absolutely, it's a, it's a fantastic question. And, I, you know, in a way, I'm, I'm very thankful to AI because it means that not only the cool kids are talking about assessment now, but everyone is. Uh, I think, you know, I think it, it really needs a reset in terms of assessment to kind of go back to what assessment actually means. I think we need to look at, at what we're assessing. Students have become far more analytical in terms of looking their, at their assessment now. I think, you know, when, when you think of assessment, it's supposed to assess the learning outcomes of a module, whether they're practical, whether they're based on knowledge, whether they're based on skills. You know, I think if we fall down the kind of trap, which I think has happened in the last sort of couple of years, is that we've been relying very heavily on knowledge recall for assessment, which, you know, when you look at, at generative, generative AI, is probably what it's best at. So I think, you know, we need to go back to, to looking at what we're actually assessing and possibly redesigning assessments based on that. I think, you know, students are acutely aware of, you know, what AI can do, what AI can't do, and probably in a lot of cases, more aware than, than some of the staff that are teaching them, which is kind of flipping the classroom in, in, a, in a way. So I think, you know, if people are concerned about their assessment, I think it, it, it's quite a vulnerable place to be as a teacher, but I think, talking to your students about your assessment is the best thing. 
looking at some of the best practice like co-design of assessments, co-design of rubrics, because then, you know, students enrolled on a course or in a module for a specific reason to learn a certain thing. So I think it's a really, you know, valuable opportunity to hear what students expect to learn and what students expect to be learned from, from a certain module or course. Okay, thank you for that. And um, then I suppose if students are learning around academic integrity specific to their programmes of study, and, and, and let's say those cultures of academic integrity are developing and that collaborative process is happening, all is well in the world once we're in our institutions, but how does that academic integrity and that learning um, around academic in integrity continue ha to have an impact potentially after graduation, post-graduation? Can it or does it still have impact then? Absolutely. I think, you know, you look at you look at the world students are going into post graduation. They're going into a world that's filled with AI that, you know, is it's being ever more integrated into systems in, in companies, in workplaces. And um, so I think, you know, by within our institutions, preparing students for that world and by rather than focusing on knowledge recall and things like that, that are very easily accessible to students in the post graduation world. If the focus is put back onto skills, onto, you know, onto application of knowledge rather than simply recalling it, I think that prepares students, you know, far more for the for the world after graduation rather than simply looking at, you know, things like knowledge recall and, you know, acting with integrity is something that can be applied far beyond just the classroom, you know. Um, you're looking, you know, I think it was Claude who talked about courageous conversations and, you know, having that kind of courage to speak up if something's not right. I think you look at a at society more broadly, you know, the, the ability to call out what isn't right and, and to hold your hands up and make a mistake is possibly something that's lacking just generally, you know, regardless of discipline. So I think by building that culture within our institutions of acting with integrity, of acting with honesty, I think that filters down not just in terms of work but just in terms of broader society yeah absolutely very well made point so and and just uh, as you've mentioned Claudia there Claudia I might bring you back in there on this kind of post graduation piece so what challenges do you think that students going into the workplace are going to face now some new challenges Owens mentioned some of them there and I suppose how can institutions help to prepare students for those challenges So yeah, the the challenges that I think students will face whenever they enter the workforce, if they have been, you know, engaging in like academic misconduct um, throughout their degree is that like they, as Owen said, you know, might not have the ability to, you know, speak up or hold their hands up when something you know, goes wrong. So I think that, you know, promoting academic integrity and engaging with academic integrity in relation to after you graduate, like it will develop ethical values and, you know, prepare students as professionals who behave with a certain type of ethics in the workforce, because, you know, with academic integrity it's all about like honesty and responsibility and ethical behavior which is all something that we carry forward um as i said you know it builds trust and credibility with the degree that you're getting from your institution and obviously the type of students that you will be hiring after graduation as well because employers you know do want to know that if they are hiring someone from a certain institution that they know that they've completed their assessments accordingly and they know that they know about what field of work that they'll be going into which is very important that we're sending you know well able people into the workforce um so like it does bring about more trustworthiness between employers, institutions and the students. Um, obviously, like whenever you're been struggling with your assignments all year and you finally, you know, 
come out at the end like it's a very fulfilling moment as well but it also demonstrates that you as a person have a certain type of you know work ethic that you're willing to put in the time and the effort that is required for you to have succeeded as a student which will go as far then as for you succeeding as an employer in an employee in uh, the workforce and obviously whenever you do complete your assignments like as I said uh, learning outcomes are supposed to be met, whether they are or not, whether lecturers are giving, you know, adequate assessments to their students. Like the whole point of getting these assessments is to prepare you and uh, it's supposed to enhance your critical thinking and problem solving skills, which are important to bring into the workforce so as I said I know that there's a lot of issues now with students just regurgitating information and a lot of students feel like their assessments aren't adequate enough they don't feel like they're actually benefiting from it so that must be something that we all have to look at whether we are helping students or if we're just throwing uh, questions at them and getting them to write answers um, again, it encourages a lifelong learning. So whenever you do enter into the workforce that you're always going to upskill, which is highly valuable for um, employees as well. And obviously, academic integrity fosters respect for other people's work. So as I said before, whenever you're engaging in academic integrity, you cite people for their work the same way that you'd like to be cited for your work. It's the same thing that goes into the workforce as well. Like you want to be acting um, in a team and you know like who wants to be working with someone who's yeah. uh, taking credit for things that they're not doing I think that you'd make a lot of enemies that way but, uh, yeah that's kind of the importance of having integrity academic integrity in college and how it can be brought into uh, the workforce or post-graduation Thank you for that, Clauda. And, and you've kind of you've mentioned it again. Assess it all comes back to in many ways assessment, doesn't it? Um, and uh, Sue Hackett has said in the the chat there. What do the panelists think about the volume of assessment? You've talked a little bit about the the quality maybe of the assessment, but the sheer volume of assessment that students have have to face. What impact does that have on your ability? I suppose to engage well with assessment and to to behave with academic integrity. Is there anyone on the panel who'd like to have to to take that one? I yeah I might just jump in and like talk about the two kind of extremes of it so uh Eddie please jump in the rest of the panelists because it's and just Owen had his hand up so we'll go to Owen next <laughs> yeah, so that always like um so yeah in relation to like let's say if we're going for the traditional style of assessment uh you've six exams or whatever in the space of two weeks all students are doing is rote learning information, regurgitating it, forgetting about it, and then it goes on and on. And how is that meaningful assessment at all? And then you can go the other extreme where students are being uh, given little small assessments during the year, but those assessments aren't equating the amount of percentage that they're going to be getting for the assessment or the, assess the lecturers aren't communicating at all. And there's three assignments due in one week and you're expecting students to keep on top of that and actually engage meaningfully in it. So I think trying to find a balance of, you know, having assignment mapping in place, um, like talking to other lecturers, asking students what kind of assessment that they feel like they would learn from. I hate the way that the form of assessment changes whenever a student has like a disability and is exempt from something. I think that, you know, that shouldn't be the case for having to switch the types of ways students are assessed. If the learning outcomes are all being met the same way, why can't students who are experts in their own learning take initiative on how they want to learn and how they want to engage with the module? Um, like some people love group work, some people love essays, some people prefer different types of assessments. So um, like if we're really living in the era of universal design of learning, I think that we're falling quite short of it. Um, but yeah, please come in, Owen, wasn't it? It was Owen, yeah. You want to go ahead, Owen? Yeah, so I think the, the volume of assessment is something that's rarely spoken about. I think there's a tendency when someone thinks there's a problem with assessment, we'll just do more assessment, which I think, you know, when you look at assessment for learning, if it's that, I think it's fantastic. And I think that should be, should weigh into a student's final grade. But I think 
you know, rather than looking at, at the quantity of assessment, I think we do, it all comes back to the quality of assessment. You know, you need to look at, and it's a very important question, why am I doing this assessment? What am I trying to achieve from it? Come back to the learning outcomes again, you know. Students are under an immense amount of pressure, more so than any generation of students between, you know, the well-documented shortage of accommodation, cost of living crisis, you know. Students don't have as much time, and if students are being presented with spurious assessments that are just kind of thrown in because I think I need to do more assessment, mm. that's when they're more likely to engage in cheating, not because it's difficult, but because they don't see it as worth their time, because they don't see it as something that's actually valuable to them. I think the best assessments and the assessments that students are least likely to cheat on are those that are co-designed, are those that are relevant to students' learning. So I think that's, it really needs to come back rather than, you know, looking at how much assessment I'm doing, look at the quality of assessment I'm doing, look at how much, how easy it is with stu for students to engage with the assessment. Because ultimately, if you're a student studying photography and you have to write a 2000 word essay, students go into a course on photography, expecting to learn about photography not expecting to sit there behind the laptop and write a 2000 word assess a 2000 word assignment so looking at more kind of innovative practice things like co-design of assessment looking at what students are actually interested in being assessed on or even thinking more outside the box in terms of interactive orals for assessment and things like that mm -hmm. it's all about allowing students and there's a comment in the chat about you know giving students an opportunity to demonstrate their understanding. So surely we should be giving students as many different chances and as many different avenues of showing that they've understood the content that's been presented to them. They're really interesting points, Owen. Thanks for that. And really bringing it more to the, the quality of that assessment, both in terms of the assessment itself, but the process that goes into developing that assessment and the collaborative process. And as you said, you, you've picked up on something Nicola said in the chat there about well, um, you know, what what is actually being achieved, what learning is coming through from the assessment. Just another question from the chat from Mairead uh, Boland here is around how well prepared do the panelists feel um, they are and learners are in general when they arrive into tertiary education institutions? So do we need to do more or does more need to be done um, at school level around the area of academic integrity. Now, I know Owen has the hand up there and he's ready to go again. Um, and if anyone else is interested in contributing or to, to put your thoughts together while Owen is talking. So off you go, Owen. Um, bluntly, yes. I think you look at the, the instruments and the assessment tools we use to assess people coming out of school and, and put frankly, they're nothing more than a rote learning competition. Um, I can tell you now that I got not bad grades in my leaving cert and I can remember maybe five things from it. You know, the focus within That's from the, the leaving whole leaving cert. cert is at Owen or just from That's one subject? The, the, I'll say one subject to try and make myself look a bit better, but um, I think you look, when you look at, you know, the focus within school and I have a kind of unique perspective on this as somebody qualified as a primary school teacher you know when we go into primary school there is a focus on skills a focus on development focus, focus more on informal assessment and then you go into secondary school and sometimes it feels like that's kind of thrown out the window a bit more innovative practices have been have been slow in coming but they have been but I think until we move away from the idea of assessing someone's full whether it's three or two years of learning by chucking them into an exam hall and seeing how much they can regurgitate, students are never going to be adequately prepared for academic integrity at third level. When the focus isn't on knowledge recall, when the focus isn't on interrogating sources, when the focus isn't on you know, critical thinking, it, it's very, very difficult. And I think you're fighting an uphill battle at, ter at tertiary education then, because not only are you teaching you know, citing and things like that, you're almost having to teach an entire new way of thinking because you're interrogating your sources in a whole new way. So put frankly, no, I don't think second level prepares students adequately. And I think, you know, to, to assume that it does, I think you're already setting off on a losing battle in terms of academic integrity at tertiary education. 
That's really interesting, Owen. So you've really drawn attention to maybe positive things happening at primary level and potentially uh, a different format then. And I think Oshin um, has, has something to contribute here. Yeah, I, I think what Owen kind of touched on there is is really, really important. I think the the sheer um the sheer drop or the difference in in learning between second level and third level is is really, really evident. And I think from a from a personal aspect as a as a student who would have uh, who, I have dyslexia, um so the standard way of I suppose the standard in, in second level wasn't ever kind of something that I was hundred percent comfortable with. Um, and as a student who, in my leaving cert, wouldn't would wouldn't have done terribly, but would not have been anywhere near the top of of a class at all. Um, coming into to, to third level, I was very very nervous in, in in terms of how I would be able to to cope with the level and the volume. And this ties into the last question as well, I think. Um, but I think there's a level of of the the sheer the understanding of of the lectures and the their abilities to um regurgitate their own understandings is really, really important. And I think definitely what Owen said about the whole critical thinking and, and, and kind of rote learning that is in second level, I think it, it it's completely different in, in third level. And there's actually almost no correlation between second level and third level. And there's no kind of link between. I think since probably definitely since I've come out of secondary school, there's been there's been moves towards that the the different uh, I, I suppose bridging that gap, but I definitely think that there's a lot more that can be done, and probably needs to be done in terms of to adequately prepare students when they come into third level, and um, so that they can prepare for like the volumes of assessment and things like that as well. Mm. Thank you, Oshin. And and Nicola in the chat has made a really interesting point, uh, really backing up what both Owen and Oshin have said there around we're pushing students into a certain type of assessment, a certain type of model, maybe at, at secondary level, um, which then we're almost entirely rejecting at third level. And then um, potentially we're, we're pushing students towards the acquisition of certain types of skills that will push them towards AI applications for assessment. So it's it's, it's a bit of a, a tricky cycle. Um, Amanda has another question actually for the panel in the chat. Um, does the panel feel that program level assessment rather than the module level would benefit um, the learning by demonstrating the relationship between all modules and the learning outcomes across modules and make assessment more authentic and meaningful. So is that program level, those program level objectives and learning more important or significant and does it need to be made more significant for learners than those very specific module level um, objectives, which maybe uh, assessors tend to, to be to hold quite close. Does anyone want to jump in on that one? Or it's maybe something that that learners don't actually necessarily feel that strongly, the difference between module level learning objectives and and program level ones. It might be more something that 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 educators and faculty feel. Um, I think it was Ushin and then to Owen. So Ushin first. Um, yeah, I, I think I often hear like the word the words learning outcomes or learning objectives from mm -hmm. modules. And I think oftentimes um, like academic staff as a whole can kind of feel regimented in a way and, and streamlined through um, what they can and can't do in terms of assessment. Um, whereas I think what they should be used to do is try and to, to build um, kind of beneficial assessment. Um, I think it kind of ties back to what we were talking about earlier about how um, there can be a level of, uh, I suppose, improvement in assessment. I think that uh, oftentimes, I think, like I said earlier, the like the academic staff have a, a huge knowledge in the areas that they work in, and I think oftentimes they might feel like, um, and now I know I obviously I'm not an academic, but I I feel that they often kind of hold themselves back from um, certain things uh, based on the learning outcomes of modules, and I think maybe is that is that a way where certain modules uh, and learning outcomes need to be looked at in terms of how they developed all since the in the inception of modules and potentially taking in the insights of people who are lecturing and also uh, may have previously written modules uh, and is there areas where they can improve on those learning outcomes in order to, I suppose, better understand um, assessment, but also how to better deliver assessment and help students to understand the modules. I, I think in terms of the question itself, I think pro like program level, I think 
I do think the 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 module level works, but I think it's that thing of of not feeling that. Um, I don't think that lecturers and academic staff should feel like they're regimented into a system where they have to uh, assess as per a certain area, um, even even if it goes against their own uh, possible like understanding of the area, mm -hmm. and that if there's areas where they can improve on learning outcomes, I think they should be able to do that. I know that there is a lot of policies and stuff involved in that, uh, but I think it's possibly something that could help break down the barrier in, in this in this instance. Okay, thank you for that, Oshin. And Owen? Um, yeah, I think it's it's a really interesting question. I think when you look at initially when a student signs up for a course, they sign up for a programme and then immediately it's it's boxed off into modules and there's very rarely that kind of whole level look at the programme again, whether it's as kind of the, the programme goes on or even towards the end of it. And I think it's really sort of pertinent when you look at large modules. So your, your 101 modules where you might have students from three, four, five different programs attending the same module. And to think that they all need the same learning outcomes probably isn't true and isn't reflective of the needs of students. Um, as well as that, I think, you know, program level does assist with a sense of belonging within the course as well. You know, your course isn't seen as kind of bitty. You know, there's one module here, one module there, one module mm -hmm. somewhere else. There's very little to tie it together. Like in my course, I was in, in primary school teaching. And the only time I really felt that there was kind of a program level view of what I was learning was when I went out on placement. Because like that, you know, you're not doing things in a box. You know, you're going out and there's classroom management, there's subjects there's professionalism, there's dealing with students, you know, as individuals. And that was the only real time I felt that my kind of learning throughout the whole program was being assessed rather than in, you know, in a box. Because you look at, again, we come back to the workplace, you know, everything is being applied almost all at once rather than it being looked at, you know, and now we're going to look at this one aspect of what you're going to do. And then in three hours time, we're going to look at this other aspect. It's always very, very joined up. So I think, you know, it's a move towards looking at program level out learning outcomes and program level assessment would be welcome because there is such a variance between modules and module learning outcomes. And with large modules, it can be very difficult to expect that, you know, 500 students from five or six different programs all require the same the same learning outcomes. Mm. Thank you, Owen. And, and that's a really, really interesting point that actually when you when you decide you want to engage with the program, it's the program, not necessarily specific modules for most students that they're expressing interest in. So that that's really interesting. And there's another question which really leads on from this in, in the chat here. Does module assessment ever lead to replication of assessment of program learning outcomes? And, and I suppose can that have some negative impacts on on the learning and maybe academic integrity approach as well. Brian, do you have any thoughts on that one? Um, I know. So we, in my course, my degree, we never looked at anything at the program level. Um, mm. It wasn't again like Owen said there. We never looked at the correlation between pro, uh, modules and programs until we got to placement. Placement is when we were finally had to write about what we were doing and how do we relate it back to other modules. And it was only then, in the second half of third year, that was it clicked that you know. There was a holistic approach going on here rather than looking at these individual modules at an individual basis that mm. there, these things were meant to come together. Um, so for, for me, I, I had never experienced anything of a program level outcomes. Um, it was never explained to us like that. It was only on always on an individual basis. Um, which always just seems like it fed into the rote learning. There was never kind of looking at a wider approach. It was learning something, doing the exam, getting out of the way, and then emptying your head out in order to get to the next exam. And it, cycle, 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 you know, the rote mm. a learning cycle. Um, so I, I think there could be, 
I don't know, I, I think something to think about pushing the program level outcomes to students rather than tr only ever trying to push it on a module based level. Mm. Making those links, I suppose. Yeah. And and Marate has a, a point that really follows on from that in the chat around, well, Owen mentioned placements and that placements can can be where all of these module pieces sometimes start to make connections. Is there more that can be done by educators around um, maybe pinpointing those those connections? But Owen, you wanted to jump in there anyway, I think. Um, yeah, and I suppose to, to tie back in kind of the, the idea of um, module level assessment leading to replication of assessment of program learning outcomes. You can, I think when you look at module level without looking at the big picture, you're almost setting students up for self plagiarism. If you're asked to do the same thing in module X as module Y and the assessment is very, very similar, I don't think you can blame a student for saying, well, I got asked this six months ago when I did this piece of work. You know, students wouldn't even initially view that as cheating because they're like, oh, well, I already learned this. So now I'm being asked it again so I can use some of that. You know, I can structure my answer or my work based on what I did before. So I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a direct concern for academic integrity if we look at kind of replication of learning outcomes that you're almost setting students up for failure in terms of self plagiarism. It's a really good point, Owen. And I suppose if we're making those links with post graduation and the workplace, it, it wouldn't necessarily be the wrong thing to do to I've worked on that before it went well, I'm going to replicate that uh, that approach again. So it's it's very context specific, isn't it? That that's a really interesting point. And um, we have had some really good questions through the chat. Um, if there's any more, I was just going to say to, to just drop them in. We have another five minutes or so um, before we start to, to wrap up. Um, so there's another question there. If they if so after the self plagiarism, if they're being asked the same questions, why wouldn't a student provide the same responses? So I suppose that's more more a commentary on self plagiarism again. Um, is that something, I suppose, that when it's been brought up, self plagiarism, is that something that that you yourselves or students or are, are, your fellow students are coming to you with concerns around um, the risks of self plagiarism? Is that something that you feel students understand or engage with? Um, because it can be quite complex, can't it? Yeah, I, I'm going to come in there because mm. I, I got caught for self plagiarizing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I didn't realize I was doing it. It was mm. a continuation of a module that I had done before. And so the same part of what I, my thought process on something was the same as it was. I just, so I used part of an assignment that I had done before and had added it in, expanded on and stood it further. But uh, turn it in, marked it as plagiarizing. And uh, despite being able to show my work to my lecturer that I had done this before, uh, I had to rewrite it, the whole thing. Now, I, I tell you, in the space of six months, my thought process on a specific topic hadn't changed, um, particularly when it was for my broader, broader service. Um, it was for my thesis. Um, so I had a specific viewpoint that I was looking at, the same kind of topics, and it was kind of using that to further on and expand it. But I was told I wasn't able to use it because it, it was already used for an assignment. So again, it's self plagiarizing. If I'm asked the same question again twice, would I not answer the same if I haven't learned any different, anything differently in between? And and that that has come as a, as you say in the in the response there. Um, and I suppose it, it it might come down to assessment design then and the way we're asking questions and the purposes we're asking questions for as well. Um, so Billy has come in there from an institutional perspective. The problem with self plagiarism is the double counting for credit of the same learning. So that, that's the rationale behind it. Um, maybe that points to a problem of uh, dis, dis, uh, disaggregating credits to individual modules. So, but I suppose maybe the point being made is that that if students don't understand or aren't aware of self plagiarism in the first place, it, it's it's hard to know how to avoid it. Owen, you wanted to come in there? Yeah, I think it, it, it all comes back to, to awareness as well of policy, mm. awareness of procedure. I think, you know, anytime I've heard kind of institutions speaking about policies that they've developed, they talk at great length of the difficulties of producing it, 
and the amount of time spent producing it. But I think the question needs to be as well, how much time have you spent promoting it? How much time have you spent translating it into students, um, into students' language? How much time have you spent speaking to students about it? As I said earlier, it's all well and good having an absolutely fantastic bulletproof academic integrity policy, but how do we measure the success of it? Do we measure it through how many students we, we put away for academic misconduct? Because I would argue that the best way to assess it is a decrease in amount of students that are getting, you know, put away for academic misconduct, that they're either not committing it or it's being resolved in a way that's more kind of constructive between staff and students. Um, so I think, you know, measuring the success of an academic integrity policy is something that's really, really difficult, but I think it's it's extremely valuable to do because like that with self plagiarism, if students aren't aware of the policy, students, the vast majority on the ground probably don't know that self plagiarism is a thing, never mind the kind of inherent issues with it, whether that's from an institutional level, an ethical level, anything like that. I mean, I was the same in final year when I was writing my thesis based on something that I had done in a previous module and my thesis was in on music education and my specialism I'd done that year was in music education. So I thought, great, I've got a fantastic basis in music education from this module that I've spent the last 12 weeks doing. I'd be mad not to include it in my thesis. And then it's almost like, well, include it, but don't include it too much. And that's when you get to the to the situation where it just it, it frankly doesn't make sense to students. Becomes highly interpretive, certainly. And that's thank you for that, Owen. And that's actually brought us really almost full circle back to where we started with Ushin in terms of well, what do students need to actually know about academic integrity? And almost as importantly, when do they need to know it? So in terms of things like self plagiarism, when are those risks more significant in a particular program of study that students need to be made very aware of them rather than just front loading at orientation where it might not feel all that relevant yet. Um, we are coming towards, I think, the, the end of our, our student panel session now, um, and I might hand over to Billy in a moment just to finish up this session, but um, I would just very quickly like to say thank you to all um, the panelists for really, really interesting um, contributions there. I know I've learned a lot from, from this session. It's been really fascinating to, to hear those perspectives. So, so thank you for so openly and honestly sharing your experiences and the experiences of your fellow students. Thank you also to everyone for all the really great commentary and questions in the chat as well. And um, Billy, will I hand over to you to finish? Or? Thank you very much, Alva. Um, that was really, really interesting. Uh, loads of um, interesting stuff, which I say we always get from a student panel. Um, uh, I really liked uh, the uh, some of the things that came through. Uh, one of my takeaways, I've sort of plundered a little bit of what Owen said about um, co-designing assessment. I think it would be really interesting, right, okay, for students to co-design program learning assessment uh, with staff. I think um, that's a, a really interesting um, uh, possibility. Um, Brian's thing of, of the 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 equities, right, okay, that Gen AI can bring. I think that's uh, that's going to be a really interesting thing, and it's going to be a challenge, right, okay, for institutions to think about that. Um, uh, but there is scope, there's so much scope about using artificial intelligence, right, to support students learning uh, rather than just thinking, right, okay, we can, we can um, uh, push it away. And uh, I come back, Oshin said this at the very beginning, right, okay, uh, that the understanding, students' understanding of academic integrity is actually key. That's really, really important. And I think it comes through time and time again. And the point being made about policies and the way policies are written, are policies written, right, okay, from a student perspective. And I think it'd be really interesting to actually get students to write the policies um, rather than um, uh, getting the institutions, right, okay, to write the policies. Anyhow, uh, thank you all very much, right, okay, for this. It's been really, really interesting. Uh, this recording is going to go up on the 
uh, QQI YouTube channel uh, next week. And uh, I hope it'll provide further learning, right, okay, for loads of people who uh, uh, look at this afterwards. So thank you all very much. And uh, I hope you'll uh, join other sessions later in this week. Thank you all.